Welcome. Welcome to the second webinar sponsored by the new Workflow 4.0 e-newsletter and ClearEdge 3D. Our webinar topic today is Best Practices in Hospital As-Built MEP Projects, Tips and Tactics to Ensure a Profitable scan -to model Workflow. Thanks for joining us. My name is Kevin Corbley, and I'll be your moderator today. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Workflow 4.0 the newsletter of 3D scanning, modeling, documentation, ideas, and opinions. And we have a compelling webinar topic for you today. Hospital MEP projects are among the most complex and challenging in our industry. And let's face it, these projects can be intimidating with their tight spaces and hidden mechanical, electrical, and plumbing equipment, all in an environment that doesn't sleep. The risk is high even for experienced 3D capture professionals. Today, we'll reduce some of that risk by showing key lessons and best practices from two recent hospital as-built modeling projects. And you'll learn what to avoid and how to succeed in your next medical MEP project. Let's take a quick look at today's agenda. Uh, we'll be hearing case studies from two experienced 3D capture professionals, and then we'll have a live demo. Our first case study will feature Claire Vanderzwag and Netterveld Inc., which has numerous hospital projects under their belts. And our second case study will be Precision 3D Scanning, another firm with deep expertise in medical projects. And that one will be presented by Ted Mort. Next, we'll bring ClearEdge 3D's Kevin Williams on for a live demo of the newest software, Edgewise MEP for Revit 2.0. And finally, we'll wrap up with your questions for our panel. Let's run a th uh, through a few housekeeping tips real quickly. Um, Everyone will be muted during the session except the presenter. And uh, for the audience, feel free to ask questions via the question box, uh, not the chat box. Uh, so in the question box during the session. And uh, most questions will be taking, taken during the QA session at the end. And the webinar is being recorded. And you'll each receive a link to it uh, after the webinar is over. And please, a reminder, subscribe to Workflow 4.0 at the uh, web address there. That's the e-newsletter for learning as well as sharing experiences, opinions, and best practices. And have some, uh, let's have some quick introductions here. I'm uh, going to introduce the panel to you. And uh, the first is uh, Claire Vanderswag. He's the Managing Director of Netterveld, Inc. in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And you see a couple things. He's got a degree in product design engineering, been with Netterveld for 13 years starting in the Civil Engineering Group and his last five years running the Laser Scanning Group. Claire, glad to have you with us. And uh, after Claire, as I mentioned, we'll be uh, having Ted Mort come on. He's the Operations Director for Precision 3D Scanning, Inc. of Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, he's got a geomatics background as well as deep experience in medical BIM. Uh, and he is the uh, chairman of the uh, technology uh, committee, and uh, as well as being a guest lecturer at uh, Arizona State University. And uh, Ted, I understand that uh, Arizona State's a great place to watch a football game. You know, it depends on the season, but uh, <laughs> it depends on who's playing too, huh? All right, great, and and. Uh, Finally, as I mentioned, we'll wrap up with a uh, we'll wrap up the formal presentations with a demo from Kevin Williams. He's the uh, chief scientist for ClearEdge 3D, and um, he actually founded ClearEdge 3D back in 2007. He's an expert in automated feature from point clouds, um, uh, and he is a recipient of two National Science Foundation research grants. So that's great. And Kevin, as always, glad to have you with us. All right, well, let me set the context now. Um, and as you can see on the screen, uh, one thing that can't be stated enough, uh, as built hospital uh, BIM and uh, MEP projects, they can be lucrative uh, for architectural and engineering firms. And uh, here's an amazing stat. Over 1,400 hospitals in the US alone are older than 15 years. So uh, sooner or later, they're going to be needing upgrading and uh, enhancements. Um, and these projects present a series of unique challenges that can erode the profitability of the job, and that's something we're really going to talk about a lot today. And uh, but understanding these challenges and uh, and planning to uh, get around them, take advantage of them, 
uh, at the outset uh, can be a real difference maker. So uh, that's what we hope you really come away with. And this webinar is really all about arming you with an understanding of how best to execute uh, hospital MEP projects. All right, so here are our goals uh, for today. Um, what we hope you're going to walk away from this webinar with is uh, you're going to discover the latest techniques and tips to ensure profitability of your hospital MEP projects, and you're going to learn how Netterveld and Precision 3D Scanning are integrating new tools and technologies into their project deliverables, and the most common unique challenges to, in hospital MEP. Uh, we're going to talk about what they are and how to overcome them. And uh, you're also going to get a chance to see Edgewise MEP for Revit 2.0 for the first time and learn how it can fit into your MEP modeling workflow. All right, with that said, I am going to ask uh, Claire to come on and, uh, and start talking about his case study. Claire, take it away. Sounds good, Kevin. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? Yes. All right. Well, I appreciate uh, everybody joining us today and carving out some time throughout everybody's busy schedule and busy day. And uh, uh, just want to thank everyone for being here. See if we can flip to the next screen here. OK. Uh, just a little bit about uh, uh, myself and the company I work for. The company is Naderveld. And we are located pretty much throughout the Midwest with our corporate office in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, we also have several other offices uh, being in Chicago, Indianapolis, Columbus, Ohio, and a couple others in Michigan. Uh, we were founded in 1977 with a focus on civil engineering and also surveying. And since that time, we've expanded our services into land planning, environmental consulting, forensic engineering, fire investigation, and of course, the laser scanning piece and BIM modeling. And we've been at it now for approximately eight years with uh, all types of projects all over the board, everything from cell towers to large BIM projects, like we're going to talk about today, uh, and even forensic investigation and crime scenes. So we've pretty much seen it all and done it all. And we're happy to be a part of this presentation today. The project that we're going to be talking about today, um, at least from this case study, is uh, located in Chicago, Illinois. It's the Cook County Hospital right downtown. Uh, the project actually, it, it's a smaller project that we did. However, it's a great example of, of utilizing the technology, uh, utilizing Revit, and utilizing the ClearEdge 3D software that we're going to be looking at here. Uh, in addition, I think it's going to be a great complement to Ted's presentation in terms of his presentation dealing with a large project on a larger scale. So we'll start out with a smaller scale project. And in addition to that, we'll talk about some fine-tuned items with, with Revit functionality, et cetera. So let's start out with uh, talking about the scope of the project. Uh, the scope simply was. Uh, documenting existing roof conditions or roof systems, as well as the penetrations going through the roof, and then also documenting the boiler room right beneath it. When we got out to the site, uh, or actually in the planning stages, uh, one of the biggest concerns was the survey control, how we are going, basically how we were going to tie uh, not only the roof together, but the boiler room beneath the roof. How that was going to work out in terms of survey control was a major concern. Uh, what we did discover was there was a, uh, a hole in the roof, more or less a skylight in the roof, that we could uh, shoot uh, points through to gather information down below. So in terms of survey control, what we did was shoot points down below in addition to that, the stairway leading to the floors below uh, was approximately 100 feet away. So it was quite tricky shooting points and basically triangulating or bringing that control down through the stairwell and through the, through the boiler room underneath. 
uh, was one of the biggest concerns because the accuracy had to be uh, spot on. And what we found out when we were complete with the process is that the error that we, we realized was approximately an eighth of an inch. And I'll show you a couple of pictures of what that looks like and, and how that all worked out. So starting out, uh, basically we sent a one-person crew and we utilized a Leica C10 for data capture and for uh, site control. Uh, the on-site time was approximately four hours and that included uh, capturing approximately five shots up there on the roof. We had several shots going down the stairway and the rest of the remainder of the shots were uh, down in the boiler room. Uh, the locations or scan locations were approximately 15 altogether. And throughout the presentations, I'm just going to throw out a couple of tips, a couple of things to remember um, while we go through this, through this presentation. And tip number one, especially for service providers and even owners uh, as a requirement, is to utilize survey control and tie floors together. Tying floors together has become so important for, for us as a survey uh, company and as a service provider. In so many, re in so many cases, uh, we've, uh, we've gotten calls back asking for additional information. Uh, and it provides such great information in terms of uh, the ability to create a, a model easy from it, uh, the ability to create cross sections, whether it's in AutoCAD or perhaps Revit. And simply understanding that the cavity between the floors has been a tremendous asset to a lot of engineers, architects, et cetera. So the challenges here on this particular site were understanding how the roof geometry related to the boiler room piping below and the obstacles that were in the area. And you can about imagine if we didn't tie this thing together properly, uh, that could have really messed things up in terms of the project or the project and the deliverable. Uh, the capturing of the data on both levels needed near perfect, uh, perfect alignment. And as mentioned before, the error that we realized was approximately an eighth of an inch. So we were extremely happy with that. And then moving forward, uh, creating the 3D MEP Revit model as a deliverable uh, was the interest of the client and the owner uh, involved in this project. take a look a little bit at the workflow and how it all seemed to come together. Uh, once we got the data back from the site, uh, due to the, the survey control that was set up, uh, everything registered together properly as we had hoped and planned on. Uh, in terms of workflow, uh, the Revit model that was produced included three elements. Uh, in this case, it included the MEP elements, the structural elements, and the miscellaneous objects. And what I mean by that is the large tanks, the valves, the lights, some of the pipe hangers, et cetera, et cetera. And if I could offer tip number two in terms of modeling is separate those model disciplines. Uh, a lot of times when our team comes together, we choose or pick out the elements we want to model. In other words, if you assign somebody to the structural elements. They can focus on those elements and complete the project quickly. Uh, the MEP elements, especially using the Clear Edge 3D software, typically one person can handle the job versus two or three. And then the miscellaneous objects can be handled perhaps by another person or followed up by the structural person. And this really, in our opinion, accelerated the project uh, to complete the model as quickly as possible. Uh, typically, we assign, or at least we used to, assign two-person teams for manual pipe and fitting creation. What we've realized with, with this new software from ClearEdge, uh, with EdgeWise, we only need one modeler. Uh, the pipes are quickly created. The pipes are quickly brought together using elbows, tees, et cetera. And the cleanup is, is, is a lot better in terms of the alignments, et cetera. So, so Edgewise really provides us the platform to, to, to drive the Revit program, to 
to create these elements and as much geometry as possibly as we can possibly achieve. Uh, a couple of great little commands within the software or options that you can utilize are the Easy Connect and the Clean Pipes for pipe segments and so on. The Easy Connect options uh, are really slick in terms of uh, adding elbows between pipes, changing the diameters of those, those elbows, or uh, adding flanges, all kinds of neat things you can do with it. And then the Clean Pipes option is for, gosh, when you deal with conduits, we all, we all know how those work. They're never straight. They're never very symmetrical. And they always seem to break up on you. So the Clean Pipe segment uh, really seems to help uh, straighten those things out, create good alignments, and bring things together. We can flip to the next screen here. Got to apologize. We're experiencing a little bit of a delay, but there it goes. So as you can see here, we've got the uh, an actual picture of the raw scan data and what that looks like right up against the, the model itself. Uh, and again, this particular case, we utilized Revit MEP, we used, and we utilized the ClearEdge software to create all the pipes, uh, all the other geometry, the miscellaneous items, as well as the structural items. And you can see there's a ton of detail down there. And when you're, when you're dealing with a space like this with a lot of detail, you're adding equipment uh, to that space or even penetrating through the roof, you want to deliver everything you can possibly see or get your hands on out there, including even cables holding up those supports. You want to get everything possible. Now, that sort of leads me to tip number three. And this really uh, is, is a, it's an excellent tip for, for Revit users who are maybe new to the MEP environment. Uh, a lot of the experts would certainly know this, but if you're just getting warmed up to the Revit environment, you're starting out with it, uh, simply creating generic families or pipe families is really all you need to do. Uh, while dealing with the pipes and scan data and clear edge, uh, bringing that type of geometry into Revit is pretty darn easy, especially with one generic family. Uh, as you begin to do that, the, the, the software really allows for a lot of flexibility in terms of adding flanges, customizing tees, and, uh, and or other fittings. As you can see there on the bottom, in that particular picture, there's a lot of detail within the elbows, with the flanges, with the tees, uh, and it's really becoming a photorealistic uh, opportunity for, to share with others and, uh, and collaboration. Another thing, too, is as you become more and more familiar with the program, uh, adding Revit system families becomes extremely important. And these families could include sanitary, water systems, PVC, electrical, and waste systems. Uh, in, the, in the image below, we use generic families for pretty much all the pipe. However, the opportunity is there to really define exactly what you have. Uh, in terms of piping, what it is. Um, and you can define different colors, uh, different insul insulation uh, to the pipe, all different types of features within the Revit environment. So it really provides a lot of flexibility once you start adding those Revit family systems uh, within the program. In addition, you're providing your customer or the owner or the people dealing with it, the engineers, the architects, et cetera, uh, a lot of intelligent information. It's not like the old CAD models where you're, you're providing pretty much a, a CAD block or a, or a color or a line. Uh, the beauty of Revit and the ClearEdge software these days is the ability to add uh, intelligence into these models. And that really allows for a lot of flexibility uh, in terms of providing quantities, uh, providing or calculating existing linear feet of pipe that's, that's in the space 
or uh, pipes that you're going to be eliminating. And in our opinion, that creates a smart design for everybody. It provides an opportunity to uh, run clash detection once the new design is placed within the space. It also provides the ability to identify any interferences, the ability to collaborate with your team, not only in-house, but perhaps other subs that are working with you uh, or designers in the area, and also to simulate, possibly simulate a large object, a large piece of machinery going into a space just like this. Uh, perhaps they have to cut a hole through the roof you can simulate that stuff uh, utilizing Navisworks, which is a great tool to pull all of this information together. Together, And that includes the scan data, the Revit models, and any additional information you want to input. So all in all, uh, in terms of the, the new workflow, you know, basically looking back uh, at when we started down this path, we were inserting had objects into the Revit environment. Those objects really had, uh, they, they were CAD objects. They really didn't have any, any information tied to them, any annotation. Nowadays, uh, we're adding a lot of intelligence, uh, a lot of freedom, and a lot of flexibility. And that has allowed us to, to create this new workflow, uh, which in this case was approximately 16 hours. Uh, as we look back at this project and estimate the time that it would have cost to, to model uh, each pipe independently, create elbows, clean up, all that, we were estimating around 50 hours. So in this case, uh, we believe the Edgewise MEP for Revit cut Naderville's modeling time down by 70%. And uh, based on our experience and the, uh, the turnaround time for our client, the client was extremely happy. Uh, to receive their model within approximately three days after scanning was complete. Hope you enjoyed today's presentation, and Kevin, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you. Okay, terrific, Claire. Thanks a lot. Boy, those were some uh, some great insights, and um, uh, it's obvious uh, listening to your presentation that there are both risks and rewards in completing a hospital MEP project, and. Um, what we're going to do now, we're going to hear from Ted Morton in just a second, but uh, before I bring Ted on, I want to remind the audience to send us your questions at any time uh, during the presentation, and you can do that via that question box I mentioned earlier, and then we'll get to those after the formal demo. Um, and uh, now let me uh, ask Ted Mort to uh, a Precision 3D Scanning to come on board and tell us about his firm's uh, recent experiences in uh, another real-life uh, case study. Ted, take it away. Hey, thanks, Kevin. And uh, you know, before we get going, I want to paint a good picture for everybody. I talk a lot with my hands. So uh, during this, just imagine me flailing my arms around, and you'll have a, a perfect visual of exactly what's going on. So I don't want to you know, detract from the presentation there. All right, sounds good. All right, so moving on, Let's see here, I think I have control. There we go. All right, so as a national you know, 3D service provider, uh, we travel throughout the U.S. Uh, performing a variety of services for our clients, whether it's site acquisition, processing, consulting. Um, We've seen a lot of growth over 2012. We're anticipating accelerated growth in 2013. And you know, good news for everybody, it, we're noticing a more receptive attitude in the AEC industry. And that should, should float all boats for us in working in the 3D world. So my company focuses about 90% on AEC, and then the other 10%, we work in the forensic market. So we've uh, we helped to refine sort of our our objectives here over the last couple of years, and uh, saw these two as as being really prime locations for a 3D service provider. We are a full service firm. That means that we provide acquisition, 
Uh, we provide modeling, processing, and we also offer that consulting service on the back end. Last year, we, we did about a million and a half square feet of healthcare projects in total. Out of that, I'd say about 60% of that work is in an active environment. And those environments, healthcare alone is, is very sensitive. But when you start working in an active environment, it is a game changer. Um, when we're working on these projects, our clients have varied from the owners and architects to GCs and trades. So we've got a, a pretty diverse view of, of all the different value points that uh, everybody engaged on a project can, can withdraw from these. All right, so our mantra here is customer experience. Uh, so the service end is a big deal to us. That positive experience and successful integration of the deliverables is a must for us in any project. Uh, that's especially true in healthcare. We're going to talk about a little bit different subject matter than what Claire addressed. Claire did some, some uh, great work there talking about technical aspects of a project. And I'd like to talk with you a little bit about some of the considerations you need to make from a strategic planning and management perspective. So here's some details from a recently completed project. It was a hospital environment, about 250,000 square feet. So it was a large facility. We had multiple levels included in this. So we faced some of those issues that Claire had mentioned, you know, moving from level to level and having control placed down there for us. It was fully operational. So through those levels, we saw a variety of active conditions. We saw everything from engineering facilities in the basement to getting to the kitchen level and patient floors that included operating rooms, emergency rooms, pharmacy labs. Uh, we, we had to take very special consideration when we were in those last mentioned areas. Uh, you can imagine the sensitivity that needs to be considered when you're operating in an active environment like an ER or a pharmacy or a lab that has um, security issues involved as well as just sensitivity issues with the patient. So our goal with any of these projects is zero disruption in service. Uh, the hospital couldn't shut down. Typically, there's no way for them to phase areas in and out. They're dealing with individual profit centers there that you have to respect. So uh, you know, keep that in mind as you're, you're pursuing these projects. Some more details about this individual project we're going to visit. Uh, the deliverable requested was an AutoCAD 3D file, so we did a lot of solid modeling here. We negotiated 10 nights for the site work, and that was heavily involving the owner. So we needed to set their expectations of how often we were going to be there. We used both Leica C10 and the Ferro Focus 3D. Uh, we sort of see that there's the right tool for the right job. And both of these serve very specific functions uh, when you're working in a wide range of environmental conditions like this. So through this project, it was captured with about 1,500 scans. And with those scans, we brought it back into the office and saw about a two-month period of processing. That included registration, modeling. And uh, you know, it's always difficult to work on that two-month you know, time frame. You say that, and you know, quite often, the deliverables needed immediately. So we worked out a phased deliverable schedule that helped put the high-value information in that client's hands within the first two weeks some software that we used during this process. Uh, on the modeling side, it was Cyclone, AutoCAD, and Edgewise. On the registration, we fell back to Cyclone, and we also used Scene pretty heavily in this. A couple of the challenges that you face when you're in uh, these conditions are uh, elements that we usually address when we're, when we're planning a healthcare project. So we're going to talk to you here about what happens when these go wrong, and then we'll look at different ways to overcome these common, common obstacles. So coordination. Uh, this and communication are really closely related. Okay? Once it falls apart between the owner, architect, GC, or trade, um, you know, there, there's not a lot you can do to make that a positive experience. So in most cases, you're going to be contracted to one of these four areas but you're going to have an impact on all of them. 
So we need to, to make sure when we're planning this out that we know who all the players are and whose lives, obviously, we're going to touch when we're in this facility. All right, site restrictions. These areas have not been prepared. Um, you're going to look at getting locked out. You're not going to have a positive interaction with the nurses, you know, in the nurse station when you tell them they can't have coffee because you're going to work on scanning there. Um, you're also not going to be prepared, so you won't have the right tools. So you definitely need to be very familiar with the site restrictions. And then uh, we'll skip over communication there because we touched on it move right to methodology. So significant unanticipated barriers will you know, ultimately prevent you from performing uh, with your typical methodology. So on acquisition and post-processing, you need to have a couple game plans in mind, and we'll get into that here in a bit. Uh, scope creep, I'm sure everybody's familiar with this. Common thing that we hear is these deliverables are amazing, but, okay? After that but, that's where the project starts to grow and your margins start to shrink. So we really want to discuss um, expectations of deliverables, but we also want to explore all the potential because, let's face it, when you're out there performing this 3D work, it is just really compelling information that comes back in, and it's hard not to get um, overly excited about it as a client and start asking for a lot of different aspects that weren't originally included. All right, so let's start solving some of these problems with the next scan. I'm sorry, the next slide. So I always encourage us to develop points of contact. Okay, a facility uh, is usually, the facility managers are usually overlooked uh, when they aren't your client. So you want to look at the department heads, the managers, uh, especially security staff. You're going to need access to a lot of, um, to a lot of spaces that will require uh, potentially an escort. So pre-acquisition meetings, these go on daily with our teams. So during these meetings, we address concerns that have come up the night before. Uh, we talk about potential impact that we're going to have on the shift that we're getting ready to engage in. And at this point, we're also going to make revisions to the plan to adjust any, you know, to any of these uh, unanticipated occurrences. Preparedness, you're going to have to do your best uh, to use site walks, points of contact, and the acquisition team meetings to anticipate your needs. You make sure that areas are prepared for you when you uh, are planning to head into them. Make sure you have the tools need to face the challenges that you're going to see ahead. And then timing is crucial in this. You need to make sure that uh, it's been coordinated with all the departments and that you're going to be accessing their spaces. So that sort of leads into that chain of command. Uh, don't let this get too complex. All right? We see that the best results are when we engage one point of contact and then have a plan for them to disseminate the updates to the rest of the team. One thing that's uh, pulling up on the bottom there is experience. And, you know, that's a pretty obvious one, right? The more your team has, the less prep it will take. But uh, it doesn't mean you can't be successful without it. You just have to really take your time and be thorough. So some tips that you can take with you. Uh, understand the facility. You need to know what you're going to get into. Uh, are you working with ER or is it an admin area? Do you have drop ceilings or are they hard lit? You know, what are the expectations for capture in all these zones? Take time to plan. Uh, you want to schedule. To, uh, you want to schedule with all the different departments. Uh, we want to know when the downtimes are. That's usually a conversation we have with those managers so that we can anticipate lulls in, in activity. Uh, oddly enough, the ER seems to slow down right as the bars let out, and I, I sort of had, a, I had the impression that that wasn't going to be the case. So, um, you know, you want to be able that you can shoot those gaps. Set expectations with the entire team, and also include the uh, communication schedule with those expectations. You want to make sure that the information that you provide and the updates are going to everybody on the team and that you're not responsible for putting it out there. You want that to be your point of contact in that chain of command. Well, we talked about the different folks you're going to impact here, being the owner, the architect, GC, and the trade. Uh, you want to make sure that you also find a resource for 
uh, within each of them and consider them all within that chain of command. So they're, they're potentially all your clients, you know, even though one of them in particular is paying you. Then you need to empower your team. Uh, allow them to make decisions on site. You know, I've, I've done some work with a variety of companies in the past that they want to make sure that decisions are all made on the top of the you know, chain and it's just, it's not reasonable when you're out there in such a dynamic uh, infrastructure. So empower one person as your decision maker on site and make sure that that person is communicating with you at all times. Um, make that leader the liaison also if you could. Um, that way they're always engaged in the conversations between the owner, your client, uh, the GC and the trades and there's a level of comfort there. And ultimately, you need to respect the environment. When you're in an active hospital, it's about as sensitive as an environment as you can get. Uh, never let your team forget that they're there to support the project team. And that includes everybody uh, and the patients. All right. I'm going to start wrapping it up here with the lessons learned. Right. Don't rely on, on one method. That goes for acquisition and post-processing. You know, be prepared to think outside the box on this. For instance, when we noticed how much time was spent extracting cylinder geometry, we morphed our workflow to include ClearEdge. So we've always sort of kept an eye on uh, emerging technologies and how they might be instrumental in us accomplishing goals more efficiently. So when we did implement ClearEdge, uh, I've got to say, I don't have the metrics to, to say that it saved an inordinate amount of, of uh, money, but it did allow my resources to refocus on higher level workload items, which I think it ultimately improved the quality of the entire deliverable. Plan for your A, B, and C contingencies whenever you're out there, and uh, that goes for the office as well. And the tent says it all. It, we first couple projects we worked in hospital environments um, had no idea that we were going to have to jump into HEPA tents to access ceiling tiles when we were in specific areas. Um, that crushes your expectation for productivity. Sort of segues right into the, the next point. It's going to take longer than you anticipate. I, I don't care how many of these I end up doing. I always end up looking back at it in the final project review and and learning something new that helps me um, estimate my next project and it's never estimating it shorter. It's always adding a little bit more on the back end for these contingencies. So make sure you build some time into your schedule so that you can do it right. You really don't want to rush in these projects. And my last tip to everybody is make friends and do it fast. Uh, when you're in a tight environment like that, there's also a lot of stress for the employees that are out there working, the nurses and doctors. Uh, we've done things like brought coffee and cookies in for the hospital staff when we're, when we're going out there through the evening shifts. The, uh, the folks out there working shoulder to shoulder with you are actually going to make or break you in this environment. So make sure you sell them just as soon as you can on the fact that this is going to be a positive experience. So. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it back to Kevin Corbley. All right. Great, Ted. Uh, thanks. Uh, it's, it's pretty obvious from what you told us that the um, success in a project like this really depends uh, uh, a lot more than just on the software and the hardware, that there's so many, uh, so many other aspects of it that uh, I guess until you, until you get into it, you just wouldn't know. Well, um, that's, uh, that was terrific. And what I'm going to do right now is we are going to uh, switch gears and we're going to have a, a demo of the Edgewise MEP for Revit 2.0. That's going to be Kevin Williams. And it's going to be a live demo. So I am going to uh, hand control over to Kevin and should be able to take over now. Kevin? Kevin, you need All to All right. Thank you very much, go. Kevin Corbley. Great. Yes. Um, uh, first off, let me uh, go through a, a, a real quick slide here, and, and and actually, let me let me give you just a just a tiny bit of background on um, on ClearEdge. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we are located um, in the the DC metro area. That's where our headquarters is. 
And we are currently having a, a, an enormous snowstorm, and it's been dubbed snowquestration for, for fairly obvious reasons. So I'm, right now I'm actually at a, at a friend's house because power is down everywhere, so it's, <laughs> it's scrounging for internet connectivity. Um, but that, uh, so um, we're, we're really quite excited about the, the, this next version of, of Edgewise MEP. We, we added a whole bunch of, of really good powerful functionality that, that was uh, a lot of people had asked for, um, including high definition visualization. Uh, we're, we have a full featured point cloud visualization engine now incorporated inside of Edgewise MEP, so you can load up billions and billions of points and be able to work with them um, seamlessly. We have very strong set of QA tools, I'll, I'll demo those, end-to-end -end finishing tools. Uh, we now support round ducting and conduit. Um, when it's exported to Revit, uh, we have uh, automatic registration to, to Revit project using Revit project base points and setting those automatically. So when you export from, from Edgewise, it just fits right into place. Um, we also have improved support for the placeholders, uh, both pipe and ducting placeholders. And we also we found that we uh, a number of people wanted to use this in Revit 2012, so we now are, are backwards compatible with Revit 2012 and we're currently working uh, as soon as 2014 is out we will be compatible with that. So with that, um, let me show you Edgewise. This is, this is the inside of, of Claire's project that, that he uh, gave at the beginning of this webinar. Um, you can see Kind of the level of level of detail. You can see all the the points um, that that were collected in the scan. One of the cool new features in our um, in in Edgewise MEP now is the ability to jump. I've only got three scans loaded up. Um, that was all I had time to, to download at at my friend's house. <laughs> um, so you you can jump from scanner location to scanner location. Um, and you can, of course, navigate around in full 3D, zoom in and out, um, and it's all out of core processing to handle the, the point cloud. Um, in the interest of time, we're running a little bit late. Um, I, I, probably most of you are familiar with the, with the core features of Edgewise, but it's able to automatically analyze uh, a, a thousands of scans and pick out the, the pipes that it can find automatically. It does a, does a really pretty good job of getting most of the pipes automatically. Um, so as I, as I zoom around here, you can see this, this processing took about uh, three or four minutes to, to extract these pipes out of this data set. Um, so I didn't want to bore you with watching a progress bar while that happened. Um, I told you we have new QC tools. So let me let me show you those. Those are really pretty, pretty cool. Um, this is our smart sheet, and the way it works is every single pipe. Let me turn off the point cloud so you can see what's see what's going on. If I click on on a pipe in the view, then oh, I'm on the wrong model. Sorry. If I click on a pipe in the view. You can see that it gives you all of the information. There's a every every line in this smart sheet corresponds with one of the pipes in the in the view here. And conversely, if I click on one of one of the lines in the spreadsheet, it'll zoom me to that pipe. So now, if I go to inspection mode and I'll just sort sort this by diameter, um, and you can if I click on one of these lines, you can see uh, the, the, the pipe and how it's fit. So it's going to look straight down the barrel of the pipe, and you can see the fit against the point cloud. I believe these were fairly, fairly dark points, so there's a bit of scatter in the point cloud. Um, but here we can just click on down and even use the arrow key to jump from pipe to pipe to pipe, and you can see the fit. If for some reason you don't think that the pipe fits correctly, that it should be a larger pipe, I can expand the diameter of the pipe and it will instantly refit against the point cloud. 
And as I zoom out, you can see that it's, it's refit that pipe um, against the point cloud. Now you'll also notice as I go down this list, it's keeping track of which pipes I've, I've QC'd. So it changes, if I click on this one, uh, it changes to yes, it has been approved, and so forth as I, as I just tab down through these. So at the end of your QC process, you can export this as, a, as an Excel spreadsheet and you have an instant record of your QC process and you can, you can hand that in as one of your deliverables saying that you've, you've visually inspected every single pipe. Now let me zoom back out a little bit and uh, continue kind of with the, the whole workflow process. Um, I, for those of you who have seen this before, and I'm, I'm just going to uh, show you the results, the Easy Connect button goes through and automatically connects, makes all of these connections as you see here, the black connections, and figures out where the elbows are and everything like that. Um, it takes about a minute to run, so I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to speed through some of this right now. Once you've got these connected, um, you can then clean the pipes and merge all the collinear pipes together. This runs a little bit faster than Easy Connect. Ah, I keep going on the wrong one. Sorry about that. All right. And now we can go back into the, the chain info smart sheet, click on an entire chain run, and we can assign Revit families. Um, so we can assign it to either pipe, conduit, or duct. And what I'm going to do here is, uh, looks like I'm already sorted by diameter. I'm going to assign all my larger diameter pipes to ducting, now obviously you would, you'd probably want to do something a little bit more thorough than what I'm doing here, but I'm just, I'm just assuming all of the, the small objects are conduit, all right. So those have been assigned, and now if I go and export it, um, you, you see I now have the option to export in Revit 2012 or in 2013, and then I also have the, the options to export as Revit family objects or as placeholders. Um, and again, in the interest of time, because I really want to get to the Q&A session, I'm, I'm, I'm running a little bit late here. So I'm just going to open up this Here we go. Open up a pre-converted model inside of Revit and show you what this looks like. Um, and here you can see that this is a round duct. Um, some of the, the medium-sized pipes are going to be pipes. And then the, the smaller objects are conduit. So uh, you can you can see the the er, everything comes across the, the the way it should be, and it's fully they're fully functional Revit objects. Um, I'm going to open up the placeholders next. So this is this is a, a pre-processed version. It takes about two minutes to convert it to to Revit. Um, this is the same model export as, as duct and pipe placeholders. And uh, these are now tab selectable. I say that. Let's see. Oh, I'm pushing the wrong button. OK. There we go. So they're all connected properly. Um, and then you can convert these placeholders um, so if I select, a, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll skip that part. But it, it, every, everything comes into Revit and has all of the, 
all the information that you need to, to start working with the, the data inside of Revit. Um, so that's that's it on on my end. Let me let me hand the the microphone back over to you, Kevin Corbley. Sounds great, and I'll take uh, control of the screen again. There we go. All right, terrific. Well, that was a great demo, and I know you were speeding up a little bit there, Kevin. But uh, we learned a lot, and uh, the reason you were accelerating was so we can move right into the uh, Q and A session. And so what I am going to do is I'm going to ask our whole panel to open the mics back up so that uh, we can go through some Q&A. And um, we've gotten a lot of questions from the audience, so let's just dive right in. Um, Claire, here's the first one for you. Um, what's the single best piece of advice you would give a firm uh, who has their first hospital MEP project coming up? That's a great question. Uh, with hospitals, uh, you better know what you're getting involved with. Um, in other words, planning is key. Uh, in a lot of cases, when you work with uh, engineers or contractors, uh, sometimes they don't even know what they want in terms of a deliverable or what to expect. So the planning portions of the project, understanding exactly what the expectations are, understanding exactly the data capture and what deliverables you are going to provide is absolutely key and a foundation to a good project. Okay, that's great. And um, Ted, I've got one for you. Actually, I was dying to jump into your presentation when you showed, uh, uh, you know, the, the suits the guys were wearing and, and all it looked like a hazmat situation, obviously, sterile environment in the hospital. But I wonder, with all that sensitive equipment that the hospital owns, do they get nervous about the laser itself disrupting or damaging their equipment? You know, it's it's a question that has come up, not so much recently, um, because it, it is being applied in so many hospital environments. It's just sort of on a, you know, at this point, they look at the the historical projects performed and say, okay, let's do it. Um, but but yeah, at the beginning, people were concerned initially, so. Um, easiest thing to do there is just supply them with the spec sheets and um, and let them voice those concerns through their technical staff. Okay, interesting. All right, and here's another uh, quick one for you, Ted. And you know, uh, every hospital is not the same. Is every hospital MEP project similar enough, or you know, do they vary so much that you know you're just constantly having to learn something new? What you know, how much similarity is there? You know it. There are a couple factors there in similarity. Uh, on the acquisition side, the, you're typically going to run into the same situations you know, repeatedly in a hospital environment that's active. Um, it, and if they're not exactly similar, it's a one-off. You know, So you can begin to anticipate those a little bit better. Uh, I'd say that the biggest variance is really with your client and their level, um, but their level of, of expertise in, in utilizing 3D data. So I've had, I've had clients that just wanted the scan data and then clients that wanted full-blown Revit models. It, it really you know, is going to depend on a lot of conversations that you have with the, with the end users to determine exactly what their goal is and what's the most efficient way to get you to that goal so that if you can use some hybrid of point cloud and model I'm not just going to make available to you a full-blown model that's going to blow your your uh, budget for this project. Got it. Okay. All right. And Claire, this one's for you. Uh, pretty specific. It said, did you run into any problems, issues with some of the non-generic categories in how they display in sections? Um, thinking about that, too, I, I did see that question. Um, our experts might be able to offer a better opinion, but uh, based on what I've seen, as long as you're signing correctly in the non-generic families or systems and making sure that you have the architectural and structural elements turned off and the visibility and everything that's needed to, to see those elements, um, I can't think of a time that we've, we've had an issue with the visibility uh, before. So, okay. in other words, it's it's been uh, we have not had a bad experience with it. No. 
Okay. All right. Sounds good. And, and Claire, uh, here's somebody is questioning some of your statistics. Uh, this person says 16 man hours. I find that hard to believe. Even the 52 man hours seems low. Can you elaborate a little bit? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, one thing I think I forgot to mention was the the space that we uh, that we scanned, especially in that boiler room, was less than 9,000 square feet. Um, a lot of the the pictures we we showed the most concentrated areas within that room. So when we divided the the structural, the MEP, and then that miscellaneous items up, uh, literally the structure itself took about an hour and a half in terms of modeling time. The miscellaneous stuff took another three or four hours, and the balance of the time was spent creating the, the pipes. And you can see, based on Kevin's presentation, how quickly those pipes generate. Within about an hour, uh, we had generated all those pipes, and we were off and running with, with elbow connections, tees, et cetera. Uh, that coupled with another modeler uh, modeling the miscellaneous items, the hangers, uh, and, and so forth, uh, they spent three or four hours there. So really, you know, all in all, it went together much quicker than we anticipated, uh, and that's because of the automated pipe uh, turnaround time that, that we really never had experienced before. Yeah, so the increases in efficiency are just astonishing here with this automated uh, technique. It, it becomes almost dramatic, especially in this case when we had good, clean data, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Kevin Williams, uh, here's a question. It came in, I think, before you spoke, and you may have touched on this issue, but I think it bears repeating. It says, how do you guys handle pipes wrapped with insulation? Um, there, there's a, a column in the smart sheet that deals with insulation, so it's, a, it, it's handled manually. Um, obviously, the, the scan data doesn't show what diameter the internal pipe is or anything like that, and, but it, there, there is the, the smart sheet information allows you to, to account for that, and then you can export either insulated or uninsulated diameter pipes. Okay, all right. And, and here's a kind of a follow-up. It says, in the field, pipes are never straight uh, or, or 90, 90 degrees, always a slight bend. Does the software usually straighten them out? The, the clean algorithm straightens it out to within the tolerances that you specify. So a lot of people want them completely straightened out, um, and so you've set a really high or, or low tolerance, depending on how you think about it. Um, other people want to completely capture the the sag of the the pipe, and so um, you you set that tolerance the opposite direction, um, and it will it will maintain that and just give you a series of connected pipes. Okay, all right, sounds good. This is a, an interesting question. It it was directed at Ted, but I think maybe Claire could jump in too. Basically, it says, uh, how do you guys charge for a project like this? Hourly rate, rate per scan, per floor? How do you do it? I can, uh, yep. oh, go ahead, Claire. Um, in this case, uh, due to the size, which wasn't uh, real big, we were, we were able to estimate it uh, on a fixed fee basis, and that included the, the scanning on site, survey control, as well as the, uh, the modeling effort. And by the way, we also moved that model into, into Navisworks. Uh, where we also delivered a Navisworks model combined with uh, the point cloud data so the client could see exactly uh, all the elements they had in the model. We use a very similar method. We'll, uh, we'll go in, majority of our projects is a lump sum, so a fixed fee, um, a not to exceed price that, that we estimate, and I'll tell you what, we pride ourselves on sticking to it. You know, we don't want to burn any bridges with change order and the heck out of somebody so we can be the low number initially. Um, so we were very realistic in that approach, and you know, we, we don't budge easily into the change order game. Okay. Sounds good. Um, hey, here's a question we knew was going to come up, um, and, and again, uh, I want to give give each of you, Ted and, and Claire, a shot at this, and Kevin, you jump in as well. Um, with time restrictions mentioned in the hospital, how was data acquired above the ceiling tiles? Carefully. Carefully, okay. Uh, you want to elaborate, Ted? 
Absolutely. There's there's unfortunately no easy button there. So what you what you end up with is usually restrictions on per area. So I can remove one or two tiles per room in an admin or a um, a low volatile area like that. Some some cases you have to use you know the tents. So you it really depends on what you face yourself with. Ultimately, though, if I'm reading into this question right, it's how do you how do you price a project out if you've got a limited time frame? Um, I anticipate that going into it, work it into that time frame through your quotation and your negotiations. Okay, Claire, you want to add anything? Boy, I couldn't agree more with with Ted. Honestly, um, those above the the, the ceiling systems are are real tough. And and honestly, I, in talking with Kevin a few days ago, we we kind of chuckled about an X-ray system. It'd be great to have an X-ray system where we could see those systems with, right. you know, somehow seeing through those drop tiles. Uh, unfortunately, it is a, it's a fairly manual process, and uh, as Ted mentioned, typically you remove one to three at a time, and you still have a lot of obstruction with diffusers, lights, etc. So uh, you just try to get as many perspectives as you possibly can. You tie it together, and uh, and uh, work through the process that way. Okay. Kevin, did you have anything to add, Kevin Williams, on that? Um, no, I, I uh, unfortunately have never had the joy of scanning above ceiling. Okay. All right. Well, we are right at the one-hour mark now, but we have a few more questions, so I'm going to go ahead and take us a couple minutes over time, if it's okay with everybody. Um, some real quick questions. Uh, here's an interesting hardware question, the C10 versus the P20. What's the difference? Um, Claire, you want to jump in? I think you said you were using a couple different scanners. Yeah, the, the P20 is the latest and greatest from Leica. Uh -huh. uh, both great instruments. Uh, we currently own the C10. Uh, we love it for uh, the range capabilities as well as the, the amount of point data we get. Uh, from what I understand, the P20 actually shoots more points per second. I think that uh, that particular instrument might uh, turn out about a half million points per second. Uh, in addition to that, um, I believe it can handle a little bit more of a harsh environment. In other words, cooler temperatures uh, and some of the reflectivity um, items that might come up with stainless steel objects, etc. Uh, I think they've improved those uh, type of reflectivity issues seen back in the uh, C, uh, C10 days as well as even the 3000 days. Okay, sounds good. And Ted, here's a real specific one for you. You mentioned 1,500 scans in 10 nights. Did you use multiple scanners there, and how long was the uh, shift you were working? Yes, we did use multiple scanners, and the the shift was a, a between a nine and ten hour shift. So we had uh, several crews out there, multiple scanners. We were all, um, you know, operating together. Okay. All right, great. And here's, uh, I think this probably is going to be our last question. Um, and this can go to either Ted or Claire or both. And this is, what's the traditional control practice um, that you use to ensure accuracy between rooms and floors? That can be done either conventionally or with the scanners. But ultimately, the best way to do that is with both, uh, whether it's with a total station and defining points or benchmarks and tying into those, uh, or setting up on points. Uh, and you can do that with certain types of scanners. The C10 and P20 both do that. Others don't, uh, but those are great scanners in terms of tying into control quickly and traversing through the site. Great. Ted, do you have anything to add? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I, d I definitely agree with Claire there. I'd say that you, know, you have two methodologies, your, your typical survey, you know, um, method of, of traversing through the hospital and, and placing points everywhere, which is incredibly powerful to, to make sure that you're, you're getting that second check on your, your control. Um, but you're also going to use some, some fairly untraditional in the geom, you know, geomatics world methods of, of using the geometrical and cloud-to-cloud -cloud registration processes. So a little bit of both. Okay, great. Well, that's, uh, that's going to wrap it up for us. Um, 
and we mainly want to thank you uh, in the audience, uh, first of all, for joining us. And on behalf of our panelists and our sponsors, Workflow 4.0 and ClearEdge 3D, uh, let me thank everyone for joining us today. And as a reminder, you'll be receiving an email after the broadcast with a link to the recording, a chance to subscribe to the newsletter that we've mentioned, and uh, other follow-up information on Edgewise MEP for Revit 2.0. And we hope to see you again soon for our next webinar, which will be scheduled for early April. And thanks again for joining us.